Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday morning here at Calvary Chapel Grants Pass. Okay, just a few announcements as everyone's making their way to their seats. Uh, just a reminder that this coming up Saturday will be the movie night here in the sanctuary at 2 p.m. So if you're not doing anything on Saturday, come join us. It's always a great time of fellowship. We have a children and youth teachers meeting in room four after on June 5th after the service in room four. Let's see, what else do we got going on? So there is a men's luncheon coming up on June 11th um, at 11, eight, wait, it's June 18th, I think. I think I mistyped it. Where's Pastor Jerry? It is the 18th? Anybody? Okay, June 18th. I'm glad you guys know more than I do here. It's on June 18th at 11 a.m. and the women of the church will be serving the men. Yay, it's about time, uh-huh, yeah, no. So there will be sign-ups in the foyer for the ladies that want to volunteer to help out. And then speaking of the ladies, there's a couple of retreats coming up for you all. There is, uh, on July 16th from 9 to 4 here at the church, there's going to be a Women's Day, whatever you ladies do when you get together for the day. It'll be here at the church from 9 to 4. And then in September, there will be a retreat down in Reading um, on September 9th and 10th. There will be more details to come on that one, but there, there will be if there's not already a sign-up sheet in the foyer for that also. And um, on the 5th of June, the Pregnancy Care Center is going to be coming for their annual um, baby bottle fundraiser and give a presentation on, on what the Pregnancy Care Center is doing and all that. So uh, they used to come every year, but I know the last couple of years because of COVID, that was kind of hasn't happened. So that'll be on June 5th. Um, let's see, tonight. We will have prayer at five, but the apologetics class is canceled because George's came down with the same stuff that a lot of us had here. So he's sick. Um, I mean, not, okay, wrong teacher. Tim is sick. I'll get it right. Tim is sick and not feeling very well. So he will, um, so we canceled that for tonight. And let's see what else do we got going on. We have a U-turn graduation. Yeah. So if we could have Alfonso come up and some of the elders and, and leaders of the ministry come up, we will, after we thoroughly embarrass Alfonso, then we'll pray for him. So... Michael's going to say a word about him, and then we'll pray for him. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, Alonzo's been with us uh, two months. Um, his brother was here before. You might remember Alberto. It's his brother. But so, we don't hold that against Alfonso. No. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. So uh, uh, Alonzo plans on staying for second phase. He's going to go home for a week. Yeah. He's only been in a little bit of trouble, you know, <laughs> and uh, he's been serving and he's got a great heart and um, we're just, he's been a pleasure. He wants to continue to serve and he loves what U-Turn is about, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and um, amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's pray. Lord, we come before you and we are so thankful uh, just for the miracles that you're working in and through Alfonso's life, Lord. God, we pray that as he goes home for a week to take care of his, his affairs, Lord, that you would just keep him safe. And God, that you would just bring him back up here. Uh, Lord, we're just so grateful uh, for all the, that you've done in his life, Lord, and all that you're going to do, Lord, because we know you are faithful to complete the good work you've begun in him. And so, Lord, we place Alfonso into your loving arms now and just pray that you would guide and protect him. And uh, Lord, we're just, like I said, excited to see what you're going to do in this next season of his walk. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good job, Alfonso. Alfonso, good job. Oh, a 
Alonzo. So with that being said, let's have the worship team make their way up here and uh, we'll lift the service up in prayer. Lord, we come before you and we are just so grateful that we can gather together here as a church family, Lord, and worship you through song and through the teaching of your word. So Lord, I pray as the worship team makes their way up here, Lord, that you would just anoint them, uh, Lord, as they lead us in the worship of you. And Lord, afterwards, I just pray that uh, you would give me your words to speak, Lord, and that you would give us hearts, hearts to heed what your spirit has to say to us today. And Lord, that you would give us the courage to be doers of your word and not hearers only. So Lord, we just thank you and we praise you for this time we have together. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. How about we all stand? Such a beautiful day, beautiful day to worship the Lord together. Amen. God is so good and His grace is so sufficient. His grace is so sufficient. It is a gift from God. That is the only way we can survive is with His grace. Only, we can only stand in His grace. Only. Not on ourselves. Only by His grace. It is a sound I love to hear, the sound of the Savior's roll as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear praises he hears. Faith. As he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear worship, he hears faith.
and it is always good to sing of his goodness and to give him praises of thanksgiving because he's so good and he has so many good things in store for us so many thank you lord Lord, awaken our souls today. And Holy Spirit, lead this worship. Lead us into your worship.
IDL, but it's better to use this. Welcome! You know, what a wonderful time it is to come into the house of the Lord and feel the movement of the Spirit. You know, in the Old Testament days, this time of offering was an, an obligation to the law. But under the new covenant tonight, it's an opportunity, no longer an obligation. An opportunity to share with God all of the, the abundance that he has given to us. We read in Malachi 3, and when God is speaking, and he's talking about the time of tithing. He says, it's the only time in the Bible where he says, test me and see if I will not open the windows of heaven. And so at this time of tithe and offering, it's an opportunity for us to open our hearts and to share with God a part of that abundance. And when we share with God a part of that abundance, we share with each and every one of you for the maintenance of the facility here, for the maintenance of the ministry of God. And we all live for that gospel. So will you share with me this time a prayer for the offering? Heavenly Father, I ask that you open our hearts and we freely return to you a small portion of that which you have given to us in such abundance. Lord, I ask that you prosper those who willingly share with you, that you lift them up and build them, and that you give discernment with the leadership of this church to wisely disperse that which you have given to us. Dear Lord, I say, your love exceeds all things, and may our love exceeds what we feel that we really can in this time of opportunity of offering and tithe. Praise you, Lord. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship in the spirit.
of our praises and you're so good to us Lord we thank you for the children that you've given us because they're gifts they're gifts from you and they're precious in your sight let's bring up some children because Jesus loves the little children the big children, we're all his little children, right? kids we're going before the army of the Lord now okay we're gonna praise him on those and on those instruments those are your weapons because praise <laughs> the devil hates praise okay. and we're gonna got the beat
stretch our hands to these little guys here. Heavenly Father, thank you for the children. We were once children, Lord, but we are still your children in your eyes, Father God. And you are Father, we're your children. So Lord, go before the children today, before them and behind them, Father God, and just bless them. Lord, and we just pray that you continue your Holy Spirit here today, that you bless the message and just bless each and one in this congregation, Father God. We just thank you, Lord. We give you all the praise and all the glory to your name. In the name of Jesus, Yeshua, amen. amen. All right, as you guys are making your ways to your seat, just a reminder, because I don't remember if I said it before service, was you could probably see all of the sweets and treats out there. Well, the youth are having a fundraiser after service for some of the things they're doing. So, you know, um, if you can support them, hopefully, like we've been making announcements, I hope you brought your sweet tooth and your, your pockets full of cash to help the youth out. So anyways, there's a bunch of stuff out there. Um, the youth will be out there selling stuff for, like I said, for their camps and stuff this summer. So. If you get an opportunity, um, support them. All I know is I picked a bad day to start a diet. <laughs> There's always tomorrow. Right. Okay, well, um, I was gone last week being sick and all, and um, it was, uh, whatever it was, it was some nasty stuff. I'm still kind of getting over it, but thank you for all of your prayers. and. Um, because it's definitely, it was definitely felt, that's for sure. And it's great, that, there's so many praise reports in this room right now, seeing Keith here, and yeah, you know, praying for him, and, and then seeing Andy on the keyboards, well, spoken like somebody who can't play a instrument at all. I guess that's not a keyboard, is it? It's a piano, but... <laughs> That thing with keys on it, and it has boards. So, but no, what a, uh, what a blessing it is. And so this week, uh, as we're going through the book of Corinthians, if you'd like to turn there, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. But the last time we were in the book of Corinthians, we were, uh, Paul was really warning the Corinthian church about avoiding uh, worldly wisdom, as, as you might recall. And, um, as he was warning them, and in this book of, of 1 Corinthians, really, that's what we see so far, isn't it? You know, this church was planted by Paul about five or six years prior to this letter being written. And, you know, all of these issues that Paul's addressing had, have already popped up in this new work, really. And so as, he, as he's addressing them, last, uh, the last time we were together, he, he was... Uh, really uh, warning them to avoid worldly wisdom, you know, not to get caught in the trap, especially within the church of, of worldly wisdom, allowing worldly wi wisdom to creep into not only the church, but to creep into uh, our lives who make up the church, right? And so that's what he was talking about. In fact, in chapter 3, verse 18, he said, let no one deceive himself. If any one among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. You know, um, and it's so true. You know, we can get so caught up sometimes. Uh, you know, chasing after or, or uh, bending towards worldly w wisdom that, uh, you know, sometimes we kind of lose the, the godly wisdom, right? The wisdom that comes straight from heaven, comes from God. And, and so Paul was warning the church, uh, you know, not to allow that to creep in. And, and it's, a, it's a good reminder for us too, isn't it? With all the things that we're bombarded with. And so... Now he kind of changes the focus here in chapter four, and we're going to read the first five verses, and then we'll talk a little bit more about it, what we can learn from Paul as he addresses the church and the Christians there in Corinth. Verse four, chapter one says, let a man so consider us 
as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. Then each one's praise will come from God. Let's pray. Lord, we uh, come before you once again and just pray that um, you would bless the teaching of your word. And Lord, that you would open our hearts and minds to what your spirit has to speak to us this morning. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So like I said, you know, this um, Paul is now addressing, you know, several things here in these verses that we'll talk about. You know, and one of them is that, uh, you know, Paul understands where his authority comes from. He understands who he's trying to please here. You know, and in these verses, he was saying, you know, it really doesn't matter what, how anybody judges me. It really doesn't matter how I'm judged or how I'm necessarily perceived because ultimately I'm going to answer to God and it's God who gives me the authority to say these things as an apostle. And it's the same for us today. And that's really what we're going to be talking about in these verses, you know, as being servants and stewards of God. You know, God has given us so much, hasn't he? He's equipped us with so much and given us such responsibility, uh, you know, that we need to be good stewards of. And it's ultimately, we're going to have to answer to God, not anybody else, right? You know, and, and as we talk about it, and that's really what he's telling the church here. It says, you know, um, it's easy sometimes for churches to get fragmented and it's easy for divisions and problems to come up. And that's kind of what he's he's covering here. So, you know, he's saying it really doesn't matter. Uh, earlier in, in the book that we went through, it says, you know, the church isn't about me. It's not about Apollos. You know, we're just we're just workers of God, just like you. You know, don't allow these kind of divisions to come in. And so uh, it's one of those things as he's addressing the problems in First and Second uh, Corinthians, he must have had a heavy heart over all of the stuff that was going on. You know, this church that God used him to, uh, to come about, you know, just five or six years earlier and all of these problems had already creeped in. You know, it, it's a tough thing, I'm, I'm sure, you know, because as he's going through First and Second Corinthians, you know, it's directed to this one congregation, uh, not so much about, you know, enlightening them with doctrines as much as it is uh, you know, correcting the things that have come up. And so as, as it goes through today, you know, we can apply it to not only our own lives, but to the church today, isn't it? Because it's the same kind of thing, you know, as it, it says in the Old Testament, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, we see these same kind of things that kind of creep into our own lives and into the church, you know, that have to, you know, that we need to make sure is not the case. Uh, you know, so uh, as we do that and as we look at the scripture and as we see how they speak to us today, you know, it, it's obvious that not only as he wrote 1 Corinthians, but 2 Corinthians, it was the same kind of thing. And 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, it says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves in the apostles of Christ. You know, there was even in that time, there was people not only, uh, you know, trying to usurp the authority that God had given Paul, but also, uh, you know, they were trying to cause division and he had to address it over and over again. And it's one of those things that, um, you know, we can really take something about because I don't know about you. And we talked about this on Wednesday. It was kind of a reoccurring th uh, theme as we went through uh, Psalm 7. You know, all of these accusations that came against Paul or they were trying to undermine um, you know, what God had called him to do, you know, Paul sets a good example 
on how to respond to such things, doesn't he? We can take a look, or we're going to take a look at his response and really see what a godly response is when somebody makes, you know, accusations or accuses us or talks about us or whatever the case may be. All those things that's real easy to divide a church, and yet um, we understand, we can take from it, you know, like I said, a way we should act in a, a godly manner. And, and really what we'll see as Paul addresses this is really... Um, we'll see three different concepts that, or you know, ways he addresses it. The first one is Paul understood who his authority was, or whose authority he was under. You know, he understood at the end of the day who he answered to. And secondly, uh, not only that, but he understood what his calling was. He knew, you know, he was assured of his calling, wasn't he? He knew exactly what God had called him to do, and he was going to fulfill it regardless of, you know, what certain people's opinions were. And, and lastly, you know, he was trusting God, uh, you know, kind of for the final appraisal, or, or it was God who was going to be the ultimate judge. It wasn't going to be people. So he knew that he had to be right with God. He had to answer to God ultimately, and not the naysayers that were, uh, you know, kind of coming against them. And so let's take a look at it, you know, at Paul's calling or, or what, uh, you know, whose authority Paul or where Paul's authority came from. And it's in verse one. It says, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. You know, I like that. It says um, earlier in chapter three, he calls himself a servant, doesn't he? You know, a bond servant, a, a slave. He knew that his master was Christ and he was serving him. Nobody else. And so as he's doing that or as he's talking about that, it says, let a man so consider us as a servant of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. You know, like I said, he knew that he was a bond sermon. I, and he also knew that he was a steward of the mysteries of God, something that was being revealed through his ministry, something that was, uh, you know, not revealed previously. It was saying, you know what, I have the, the gospel message that was given to me to preach, uh, you know, by Christ. And I am the steward of those mysteries. And I'm going to do whatever I can to fulfill that calling that God's put on my life. It doesn't matter, you know, who it is or what they say. I'm going to look for God for the answers. I'm going to look for God for the, uh, the praise and the approval, not man's approval. Because the one thing that we know, and especially in Paul's case here, you know, that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. So if we're called to not only live out the gospel, but preach the gospel, then why do we care what anybody says? It's foolishness to them that are perishing, right? So why would we allow their opinions to uh, stop us or derail us or change our focus or even worse, change the message of the cross just because we know somebody's not going to like what we have to say, right? It doesn't work that way, or at least it shouldn't that way, but sometimes... The church and us in the church have become so politically correct that the message gets dumbed down, doesn't it? You know, the full gospel doesn't get preached. And that's really what Paul's saying here is saying, I don't really care what you have to say in the sense that, um, you know, a, a, about the message of the cross, about the gospel, about what I've been called here. I'm going to preach it and I'm going to I'm going to preach it exactly uh, as it was given to me. I'm not going to change it because there's some pressure or some opinions on me. Uh, you know, uh, well, can't you dumb it down a little bit? Or, you know, do we, we really have to talk about, you know, the hell part of it? It gets a little uncomfortable when you, you know, whatever the case may be, you've heard various arguments, but, uh, you know, Paul's saying it doesn't matter. I don't really care. I've been, I've been called to be a steward of the mystery of God. You know, I have to, um, preached about these mysteries of God that they've given to me, as it says in Romans chapter 16, verses 25 through 27, it says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, 
but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to faith. To God alone, wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. See, he received the, the call to preach the mysteries of God. And he says, you know, regardless, I'm going to preach it. It's one of those things that I have to do. Um, it originated, you know, it didn't originate from Paul's own mind, didn't it? That call in the gospel originated from Christ himself who called him to this uh, to that ministry. And, you know, that's the, that's the wonderful thing that we have uh, about serving God is we all have a ministry here. We all have a, God has a purpose for each and every one of us. You know, you guys are probably sick of hearing it, but if we got a pulse, we got a purpose. And everybody in this church, you know, as long as you're still breathing, God wants to use you. You know, because if, if God was done using you, he wouldn't keep you on this planet any longer than what was necessary. So if you're still here and your heart's still beating, God wants to use you. It's just that simple. You don't, you don't need any other, uh, you know, affirmation of it. Like I said, if your heart's still beating and you got breath in your lungs, God wants to use you. There is a ministry for you to fulfill. You know, and we all have varying gifts, don't we? You know, each and every one of us have been called to do something. Not all of us are called to, you know, be up here or over here uh, singing or whatever. But each and every one of us have a have a plan and a purpose. And whatever that is, no matter how big or small, um, you know, God, God is going to judge each and every one of us based on what he's called us to do. Not what. Hold on a second. I'm about to have a coughing fit. The remnants of the cold. Sorry about that. But it's true because, you know, as it goes on in verse two, it says, moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. You know, um, whatever your calling is, whatever God's equipped you to do, he's going to it says that you're required. You should be found faithful and a good steward of that that he's called you to do. Right. Uh, you know, not we don't have to go beyond our calling. We don't have to accomplish, you know, what we think in our own mind are these huge things or these great things or be the next Billy Graham or whatever the case may be. No, the your highest calling is what God's called you to. It's simple as that. You know, there's nothing greater or nothing smaller in the kingdom of God. It's just what we've been faith, called to be faithful to. You know, some of the most unnoticed people in this church are the ones that are the most most faithful. They're the ones that are praying behind the scenes. They're the ones taking the trash out. They're the ones, you know, whatever the case may be, that really are, are the kind of the thankless jobs of the church. And yet they're doing it faithfully because God's called them to do it. Right. That is just as important as anybody else in this church. You know, it's that faithfulness of doing what God's called us to do. That's all we're required to do. God hasn't called us to, you know, not everybody's been called to go to some foreign country or or someplace like that to preach the gospel. God might have called called you to scrub the toilets. And you know what? That's just as important job in the kingdom of God. You know, I, I, I'm not making light of it because it's true. It's what God's going to judge us based on our faithfulness. Right. And in, in our calling, it's just I love that part of it. So we need to make sure that we're we're faithful in those things in the you know, because each and every buddy here that serves in some capacity, like I said, I don't care if it's, you know, in a prayer closet or it's a greeter or whatever the case it all. It takes all of us working together so that we can, um, you know, come together in an environment like this where we can talk about the mysteries of God. And more importantly, we can equip each other so that we can go out to the dead and dying world and share the mysteries of God that up to this point haven't been revealed to them, that they don't know the truth. Because like we've talked so many times, this isn't the church. Church isn't in here. This is a great family gathering, and it's important that we do it, 
right? And we can encourage and everything else, but church is out there in the park and church is out where the lost are, right? It's shining the, the light of the gospel to the, to the dead and dying world that up to this point, the cross is still foolishness as it was to us at one point in our lives, right? That's where the church is. And that's something, that's how we can be good stewards of, the, of that gospel message. And like I said, it's not necessarily that, um, you know, you have to be up here or you have to be one of the ones teaching in a class or whatever. Everything that is done within this church that get it to the point where we're able to have the services and we're able to do the things that, you know, for some it's giving, for some it's, it's serving, for others it's praying, whatever the case may be, it, it takes all of it. And I love that about the way God's called us. He's called us all to do different things. You know, so that's the first thing, you know, don't, don't allow anybody's opinion to detour that either. Because some of the most miserable Christians I've ever met are the ones that are running from their calling. The ones that are running from what God's called them to do because they're not living the life that God's called them to. And God loves us too much to allow us to be comfortable uh, in our rebellion, doesn't he? No, you know, he's, he's going to make sure that we're uncomfortable. And thank God for that. Because if God allowed us to be comfortable in our rebellion, then we would never make it back to where we should be, right? No, God's like, nope, not going to do it. Not going to sign off on that, Kevin. Nope, get back on track. But Lord, I don't want to go to church today. You don't have a choice. You got to preach. No, no. I'm teasing. I digress as normal. But anyways, uh, so it's true, though. You know, it's one of those things where, where God loves us too much to allow that. Just like, you know, uh, those of us who are parents, we love our kids too much not to correct them, not to counsel them, right? To teach them. We love them too much. It might be uncomfortable on them, and it might be uncomfortable on us, but it's one of those things um, we love them too much to do. And so, th so that's the first thing is, is, like I said, we know where our calling comes from. We know where our authority to take care of our calling comes from. And that comes only from God. We don't need the praise of any man or we don't need, uh, you know, anyone, uh, you know, kind of affirm that for us. That comes from God. Our calling only comes from God. And so then the second part of this, as Paul's being questioned here, um, you know, he also knows who he's going to answer to, who is going to ultimately hold him accountable, right? And we see that in verse 3 and verse 4. It says, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. You know, I was saying, you can say whatever you want. You can judge me however you want, but the only one ultimately that's going to judge me is the Lord. In fact, I'm not even going to allow myself to be judged by myself. And, you know, because one of the most paralyzing things that can happen in the Christian walk, and I've seen it over and over again, you know, counseling people throughout the years, is people can be pretty harsh on themselves too, right? You know, be so judgmental on themselves or judge themselves so much that they become, you know, kind of useless in the kingdom. Well, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not qualified. You're right. You're not. It's only through Christ that you can be qualified, right? You know, it's only through God's calling that can make it happen to begin with. So why are you worried about it? Why are you going to judge yourself or allow other people's opinions to matter to you? Paul says, no, ultimately it's only God. And I'm assured of what my calling is. And so I'm not going to allow any of these opinions, any of these judgments, even my own, to detour that or to get in the way of that. You know, um, really, you know, in a way, Paul's not saying, I don't care what you think. What he's really saying is, I care more about what Christ thinks. You know, he says, he doesn't say, you know, I don't care what you think. He just says it's a very small thing. Meaning, uh, you know, the opinions as compared to what, uh, who we have to answer for 
Um, ultimately, it's a very small thing what anybody thinks, isn't it? You know, I, I'm not trying to say that we blow off everybody's opinion in, in the sense what we do or what we should do is receive those opinions or the corrections or whatever they are, pray about it and see what God says, because who knows? You know, that's a part of it too. God may be using somebody to speak into your life. So we have to be humble enough to understand that too, but also strong enough and, um, you know, wisdom, and, yeah, wise enough to know the difference, to know, no, um, you know, God's calling me to do something this way, and he's confirmed it, so thank you for your opinion, but it's a very small thing, you know. But like I said, at the other time, we want to be sensitive enough to know, okay, God's bringing them there because I have come off, got off track a little bit, and God's speaking through this person into our lives, you know. There's... Knowing that discernment is, is important, you know, that, that you know, uh, as he's saying here, it's a very small thing. He's putting the criticisms or, or the judgments or, or whatever. He's saying, you know, all of these things, it's a very small thing. And we really need to make sure we, uh, you know, kind of do the same thing is that we keep the perspective there of ultimately who we're trying to please. Right. You know, as he's saying, I'm held to a higher standard. Um, I'm held to a higher judgment and I'm going to worry and focus more on how Christ perceives what I'm doing than how anybody else is. And, and it's a wonderful, you know, it's freeing when we're able to do that, isn't it? It's freeing when we're not worrying about the judgments that we place on ourselves or the judgment that people put on ourselves. Why is it freeing? Because ultimately, we know that Christ knows better. We know that God knows better and that he only wants the best for his children. So whatever's going on, if we can understand and we can really see um, um, who God is in our lives and understand that that's our calling, then it's way freeing. We don't have to worry about all the weights of the world uh, holding us down any longer, do we? It's just like, you know what? I'm accountable to him and I'm going to follow him and I'm going to keep my eyes focused on him. All the other stuff, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll pray about, but you know what? Ultimately, I'm just here to please God. You know, and we see that, and as it goes on, in, <coughs> excuse me, in verse 5, it says, Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will bring uh, to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. Then each one's praise will come from God. You know, because ultimately, you know, uh, our final praise will come from God for the things that we've done with a pure heart, isn't it? Not from man. In fact, if we're doing anything, if we're serving in this church or, or we're doing stuff and we're doing it looking for praises of men, I don't care if it's giving, I don't care if it's you know, serving, you know, one of those things where you're serving, you're kind of looking, I wonder who's noticing how hard I'm working here. Or, or boy, you know, nobody said thank you for, you know, the service I've been doing. Um, we're doing it from the wrong heart, aren't we? Because that's not what God wants for us. As we're serving here in the church, as we're serving Christ, as we're being a stewards for those mysteries that God has given us the knowledge of, we need to make sure we're doing it with the right heart because God's going to, uh, you know, he's going to test our hearts about it, isn't he? It doesn't matter how much we've accomplished or we think we've accomplished for the kingdom. If we've done it with the wrong motive, then it's not going to amount to anything. You know, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, it says, the second part of it says, For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know, it, he's saying, you know what? I'm not going to look at the external. I'm, I'm more worried about the internal. I'm more worried about the eternal. You know, I'm not worried about those external things that, that you know, we as humans would look at. You know, oh, wow, look at how how, you know, uh, holy they are, look how they act. But yet inside, you know, it's a whole different story. God sees the heart and he's going to judge us for our motives. Like I said, for that, for the internal part, um, you know, and, and throughout scripture, we see those kind of warnings, don't we? We see those kind of, um, it says the same thing in, in uh, later on, it says, 
Paul says, if I have not love, it profits me nothing. You know, as he's talking about the church and all the gifts that they had and celebrating uh, all of their spiritual gifts and almost, you know, elevating people because of their, where they're looking more at the gifts instead of the giver of the gifts, where they're looking at the, at, at the performance of the gifts instead of the spirit who brought those gifts, you know, it was saying all of that doesn't matter. I don't care how much you accomplish. I don't care how much you practice all of these gifts. If they're not done in love, if you don't have love, then they, there's no profit to them. Don't even do them. Don't, you know, just cease doing them if there's no love. You know, if you don't have the right motives behind it, it doesn't matter. You could be the most wildly talented person in the world at whatever, at speaking, at singing. But if you're doing it with the wrong heart, don't do it. You know, don't serve. I don't care how much you give. If you give begrudgingly or with the wrong heart, don't give. God doesn't need your money. It's not about that. You know, but God wants us to give with a cheerful heart, right? He wants us to not, and I'm not just talking finances here. I'm talking about our time. I'm talking about our, our you know, our, our motives, our whatever it is. God wants us to give it with a cheerful heart. He, you know, if we're doing it just out of compulsion, like because we have to or it's what's expected of us, don't do it. You know, because that's not what God looks at. You know, Jesus warned uh, the Pharisees about it. You know, or talked about them. It says, woe to, in Matthew 23, verse 27 and 28, it says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like the whitewashed tombs, uh, which indeed appear beautiful outside, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Give me just a second. I'm about to have another coughing attack. You know, so it says here, back in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 5, that, you know, God um, is going to know our, he's going to test our motives, isn't he? He's going to check our motives, and we're going to be rewarded for those things that were done within the right motives. Um, you know, it, it's one of those things that we see here. It's only him, you know, but, and we see it all throughout Scripture. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, it says, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I have still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. You know, he's saying, ultimately, it doesn't matter what kind of praise that you're getting from men. It doesn't matter, you know, how, how accomplished you seem with men. If you're doing it under the wrong pretext, if you're doing it with the wrong motives, it's not going to amount to anything. You know, and I see this, and I've dealt with people like this all the time where, um, let's take Facebook or something. You know, they value their worth based on how many comments they get or how many likes they get on some post. You know, it's like, if that's what you're, where your value comes from, you're in trouble. Take, take that phone or that computer and just throw it in the trash can because it's no good. You know, if you're doing anything for, you know, the amount of people or the amount of likes or the amount of comments, you're doing it with the wrong heart. No matter what's said on there, it's, it's true. But we see it a lot in this day, isn't there? There's, there's such a form of narcissism that we have as a society. It's like, well... Yeah, I spoke a gospel truth, let's say, on Facebook, but nobody liked it. So I'm going to be mad. I'm going to be upset. But God didn't call you to get 2,000 likes. He, if he called you to write it on there, that's all he called you to do. It's up to God for the increase, right? And, you know, it, it's, and we see it through... The church gets caught up in that number of games, too. Well, you know, at that service, there's only eight people. Okay, well, eight people are being equipped or eight people are learning the truth or eight people are are drawing closer to God then who cares how many people go you know it, it makes me think of like the women's u-turn ranch that was only open for a few months well people got saved and people drew closer to the Lord and if I would have known in the very beginning you know as we prayed for it for 10 12 years if one person was going to be saved would it be worth it yes. 
Yeah, yet, um, you know, it was like, oh, well, I can't believe it was only open for this amount of time or whatever. You know, we see things from our own heart, not the way God sees it. Because in God's economy, one person being saved at whatever we do, it was worth it. You know, fill in the blank. So we also have to see it from God's perspective. So as we kind of, you know, start to wrap this up and we look at these verses here in 1 Corinthians, um, the first thing that we need to do when we come up against these trials is, as just kind of a summary or, or opinions or attitudes people have towards us or towards the church is um, we need to understand our authority. What uh, and who has given us our callings, right? Whatever it is, you know, God's equipped us to do certain things. And because ultimately, the second part of it is we know who we're going to be accountable to ultimately. You know, not, let's not get caught up into the court of public opinion, right? And finally, you know, we need to trust in God, who's the righteous judge, that ultimately he's going to be the one, um, you know, that we answer to, not to anybody else. And as we, um, you know, it's, uh, I really appreciate these words of, of Paul under the circumstances that he was going through. You know, it, it had to be difficult and he understood where he was coming from. He understood um, that, uh, you know, regardless of all the ups and, ups and downs, you know, that um, he could echo the thoughts of Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And it says, let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us all do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. You know, it says, and let us not grow weary doing good. You know, let us not grow weary doing good. Why? Because if we're doing, the only things that are good comes from God anyways, right? And if we're doing good, he's saying, don't grow weary. Why? Because you're doing ultimately what I've called you to do. So we don't have to tire. It's not up to us to worry about the results, is it? It's not up to us to worry about how things are going to play up. All we're just we're just called to, uh, you know, accomplish what God, whatever God has us to do. The results will come later, or they won't. It's not up to us, and we shouldn't really care. All we've been called to do is what God's called us to do. I, I've told this story before to give an example. At the, at the last church I pastored. Um, when before the uh, the worship leader that ended up coming to the church, um, he was struggling, had a rough time, and he sold this 12-string guitar he had. And then he, you know, rededicated his life, and over the years ended up becoming the worship leader. But he would always talk about that 12-string guitar and how much he missed it, and just how beautiful it was. And so I had a dream. Kevin, you need to go buy that guitar, no matter how much it costs, back from the guy who had it. Because I knew the guy who had it, and he was a Christian. So I was like, yeah, 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 and never did. And then the Lord gave me that dream once again. And I was like, okay, that's twice this has happened. Maybe I should listen to God. But I didn't. So, so I had that same dream a third time, and I was like, okay, God's really trying to tell me something. So I called the guy, you know, I called, I was like, hey, um, his name was Bobby, as I recall. I was like, hey, you know that 12 string guitar you have? Well, because um, he was Christian and I said, you know, God has given me this dream three times and he really wants me to buy this guitar back for him. And he paused for a minute and went, no, I like playing it too much. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, have a nice day. But you know what? Um, although the results weren't what I thought they were, um, you know, God relieved me of that burden because I took that step of faith. I did it. I didn't know what the results were going to be, and it really wasn't up to me. You know, I thought I was going to have to go buy this guitar, but no, God just wanted me to call and ask about the guitar. He just wanted me to be faithful in that part of it, and I don't know. And maybe eventually, um, you know, it, it convicted him, and he... And, my old worship leader ended up with the guitar. I have no idea, but it's not for me to worry about. It was just that, you know, God had called me to do something. And finally, after enough, after him being, telling me enough times, I did it, you know. 
Uh, but the point is, is, like I said, we don't have to worry about that, do we? It's not up to us. The increase or the results are not that. We just need to do what God's called us to do. And it's simple, you know, we, um, but it's so easy for us to get so judged. Well, I'm not equipped to do that. I can't do that. You know, I know, you know, um, I'm slow with speech, Lord. I can't do that. Have somebody else do it, you know. Um, have, the, have a professional go preach the gospel, not me. And yet, each and every one of us are called to live the gospel out in our lives, isn't it? You know, we should be, the gospel should be um, screaming from each and every one of us as we're in the grocery store and as we're here. You know, it might not necessarily be in words, but in our thoughts, our actions, you know, there should be something different about us than the world. So, you know, it's one of those things we need to make sure that whatever it is, you know, um, ultimately our praise is going to come from God. So we don't have to worry about how somebody responds. We don't have to worry about that. And like I said, it is freeing to understand the only one that we really have to please is God. Amen. Amen. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. And speaking of prayer, sorry, as get you all ready to pray. Um, there will be pastors and elders up here to pray with you. So if you have anything that you need prayer for, please make sure and come up and uh, allow them to uh, pray for, pray with you, and pray for you. So Lord, we do come before you, and we are so grateful that we have your word, Lord, to both challenge and encourage us, Lord. God, I pray that we would stay as a church fully focused on you, Lord, and that we wouldn't allow those things um, and judgments and whatever else opinions of the world to creep into this church. But ultimately, we would just stay focused on you because we know um, you are our judge, Lord. You are uh, uh, just the perfect judge in that other people's opinions are, as Paul says here, just a small thing. So, Lord, we just love you. We praise you. God, I just pray that you had blessed the remainder of this day. Lord, we pray as, as we leave here and we interact with the youth, Lord, um, that you would bless them too as they're excited about going to camp and doing different things. God, I just pray that um, as you're raising up the next generation, Lord, that um, you would just keep that excitement in them also. So, Lord, we just thank you. We praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the music or the uh, worship team is going to come up and do a final song, right? Yeah, okay. And then afterwards, like I said, there will be people up here for prayer, anything that uh, you need prayer for. So have a blessed day. Yeah.
Yeah.